My third son, Abel, was in preschool. I also had a second grader and a kindergartner and a one-year-old at home. So Abel's preschool teacher had this cute idea that all the kids would bring in baby pictures for a project. She gave us a week's notice, but I remembered the night before. I frantically searched for a baby picture of him and realized that I had never printed one single picture of him in the three years he'd been alive. I had nothing. I did, however, find a printed picture of my second son. So I pulled it out, showed it to Abel, and told him, you were such a cute baby, which wasn't a lie. He was a cute baby. I never actually said that the picture was him. And I sent him to school with his brother's baby picture. He totally bought it. Preschoolers. This is the How She Moms podcast with Whitney Archibald. I'm a mother of five on a mission to help moms connect with your kids, manage your homes, and create your own unique version of motherhood. I curate ideas from different moms so you can pick and choose what works for you and your family. Before we get started, I'd like to thank BetterHelp for sponsoring this episode. BetterHelp is therapy that feels like it was designed for busy moms. There are a lot of things that stand in the way of moms taking care of ourselves and getting the therapy we often need. Scheduling an appointment, arranging a babysitter, even finding the time to drive to an office building. With BetterHelp, all those obstacles disappear. It's professional therapy done securely online. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can start communicating within 48 hours. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional therapy. The service is available for clients worldwide, no matter where you live, so even if you don't have a lot of local resources, you get access to over 20,000 experts. BetterHelp is committed to finding the right therapeutic match for you, and it's easy and free to change therapists if not. You can also log into your account anytime and send a message to your therapist. You'll get a timely and thoughtful response, plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you don't have to find that babysitter. You can even schedule it during nap time. Plus, BetterHelp is more affordable than traditional offline therapy and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit BetterHelp.com, that's better H-E-L-P, and join the over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. There's a special offer for How She Mom listeners. You can get 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com slash How She Moms. I don't think I'm the only one whose photos and videos are locked in digital form. In fact, when I asked people on the How She Moms Facebook group about their tips for pictures, I could literally feel moms ramping up the guilt. The responses were full of shoulds. I should print more of my photos. I should hang more family photos. I should make some photo books. I should clean out my photo roll. But here's the thing. The season where you capture the cutest childhood memories is usually the season that you have the least amount of time to organize those photos. The purpose of this episode is not to make you feel guilty for all the things you should be doing with your family photos or overwhelmed by all the work you'll have to do to get on top of it. The goal today is to help you create a system for managing your photos that works for you in your current stage of life. We'll give you some tools and show you how five different moms manage their photos, but also give you permission to do the bare minimum now to protect and organize your photos so they'll be there when you get around to doing something with them. Then the next episode will be about how moms use those photos and videos to tell their family stories, some of the creative ways people display pictures and make them more accessible. Before we get much deeper into the episode, though, I want to introduce you to Casey Von Stein, a.k.a. Miss Freddy, who will be our main expert in this episode. Miss Freddy got her nickname because she looked like Fred Flintstone as a baby, and it stuck. We'll keep calling her by that nickname in this episode because it will help you remember how to find her online at MissFreddy.com and on Instagram at MissFreddy, and I'm pretty sure you'll want to. She started her family photo career as a photographer for 10 years, but she found that what her clients and blog readers wanted even more than her beautiful photos was a way to organize their photos. We have kids. We want to document every moment. Our phone is in our pockets. The, the kids keep growing, and so we keep taking more pictures. And if you don't have a system in place, it, it just it just spirals and, and you can't find what you need when you need it. And you you can't do the, the things to get the photos into your family's hands so they can actually enjoy it, like the books or the videos or photo gifts, all that stuff. It's too hard to do when you're feeling overwhelmed by the, the camera roll size on your phone. So Miss Freddie made a big pivot and started a business as a photo organizer. She, or another member of her team, will actually organize your photos and videos for you. But she also teaches courses on how to organize your own photos, how to back them up, how to take pictures of your kids, you name it. 
She even gave us a special deal for How She Moms listeners. You can get 20% off her online courses and digital guides if you use the code How She Moms when you check out. Today, she's going to give us a glimpse into her tried and true system, which she uses with her own family, and we'll also hear from a few other moms about their systems. So whenever I do an episode about creating your own systems, I like to start by talking strategy and then move to tactics and logistics. It might seem obvious why we take and save photos, but let's break it down into several different objectives. The first is to help us remember. Here's Lubna Jamal, a photographer and mother of two teenage boys. I tend to forget a lot of things if I don't have it captured in photographs. And just seeing it um, in, in that form evokes memories and then it evokes, it helps me write then about them too. Um, So for me, pictures are very, very important. To hear more from Lubna, you can listen to episode 58, How Lubna Teaches Her Children About Their Family History. And you can see her beautiful photography at lubnajamalphotography.com. And here's Miss Freddie with her thoughts about remembering. My kids are eight and seven and I have totally forgotten what those everyday moments were like when my daughter was in the carrying car seat. I have terrible memory (laughs) and I don't remember. I like to blame it on mom brain, but I don't remember a lot. And so I love looking back. It changes so fast. Like my kids are just not babies anymore. The second objective is to help our kids remember. I asked my sister Cassie Gad why she thinks it's important to capture memories and photos. You know, you think of an entire lifetime and how small a portion of it is childhood. It's really great to be able to look back on their childhood in pictures because that instantly will bring back the memory. And it brings back different memories for different kids, too. All of my kids will always remember when Naomi, she's like five, when she just chopped out a big nasty onion. Did you take a picture yeah, of her we took a picture with the onion? and a video of her actually, she's like, it's not very bad. I kind of like it, but it's kind of souring my brain. <laughs> One of the most sacred roles of mothers is to be a witness for our kids' lives, especially the early parts that they won't possibly remember. Taking pictures is one way to witness them. This is one of the main reasons my friend Cami Coburn takes pictures of her seven children. So it's a way for me to honor them, you know, so they have memories of of them as kids and a way to keep our family history. The third objective is to help our kids feel important, give them a sense of identity and self-esteem. Here's Cammie again. There's a lot that I've recorded, like little things my kids say, like when they were three or, you know, just I I never would have remembered unless I wrote it down, you know. And it's so fun for me to read that to them. And I just feel like it helps them feel special and included and valued. This was definitely true for Vanessa Quigley. Her parents were really good about documenting her family's life as she was growing up. It really gave me a foundation of, you know, who I was and what was possible for me in my life in self-esteem. Like that, that's really what I, what I took from that. And so, um, and I've seen, as I've tried to document our family story, I've seen our kids kind of hold on to that and, and hold on to the stories of our life together as a grounding point. Vanessa went on to make a career out of preserving family memories when she and her husband started the company Chatbooks. You can hear more of my interview with her in episode 73, How Vanessa Tells Her Family Story, and in episode 69, How She Discovers Kids' Talents. Cami came up with another great reason to take pictures, to document the often invisible work that goes into motherhood. You know, time goes by so fast, and as moms, we're so busy that I just feel like I want some credit somehow (laughs) (laughs) for for everything I'm doing and, you know, all of the energy and work. And and just with really, I I just write and record really simple things, but but I I just feel like if I didn't write that, then life would just go on and it would never be remembered. And the fifth thing we'll talk about is family bonding and cultivating culture. Vanessa felt like these were some of the positive effects of taking family photos, but she wanted some data to back it up. So our chat books partnered with HP a couple of years ago and did a pretty big research project. Um, we surveyed tens of thousands of families about 
specifically printed photos and how printed photos helped strengthen their families. And the data was fascinating. And 98% uh, of the people that responded said that when they look at printed photos together as a family, they share more of their feelings and experiences and they tell stories. And it's, a, it's something that the psychologist we were working with says is called elaborative reminiscing in okay. their field of work. And these elaborative reminiscing conversations, um, there's so much research tied to outcomes with, of elaborative reminiscing that we would want for our families, including reduced um, anxiety, increased problem solving, ability to um, use language, less instances of depression and stronger self-esteem. Like all of the things we want for our families can come from sharing stories while looking at printed photos. And it's those stories that shape the, the narrative of our life. And, and everyone knows a good story isn't all, and it got better and it got better and it got better, right? All of the great stories have like some hard challenge that you have to overcome and, you know, you can hit, you hit rock bottom and then you figure your way out and that's what makes you stronger. And, um, the hero's journey, like our life is just one giant hero's journey, just going over and over again. And I think as parents, we can help our kids recognize, you know, how these things that happen to us through life, they're not meant to just be ignored. Like we learn from them and we learn from them by talking about them and what lesson, you know, comes from our successes, but also our failures and the hard things that we have to go through. So I think just constantly talking through our stories and, you know, having a photo of something gives you some background to have a conversation. But I also know that there's a lot of my childhood I don't remember that the, really the things that I remember, there's a photo for. Yes, managing photos can be overwhelming, but most of us do it anyway, to some extent, because it's important. So now that we've talked about why we take photos, let's talk about what to take photos of. Most families pull out the camera for special occasions like holidays, birthdays, and vacations, and many get periodic professional photos taken as well. But among the moms I interviewed, it was unanimous. Their favorite photos are of everyday moments. Photos that capture a specific season of life or that really show the personality of their kids. For me personally, I like like the smaller, um, smaller moments in life, right? It doesn't have to be a big milestone because they all end up looking the same, right? It's always around a birthday cake or, uh, you know, in a, in a certain dress or whatever. Um, so I, I like capturing the more intimate moments and uh, with my own kids. The good news is that you don't have to be a professional photographer with a nice camera. Our phones these days really do take amazing pictures. Here's a great idea of how to remember to use them more from Miss Freddie. I did do a project when my kids were little that I love and they're some of my favorite photos and I used to call it day in the life and I would force myself to get out my DSLR and take pictures using that camera of all the tiny little moments that I normally wouldn't photograph just all day and those are some of the pictures I have framed up in my kids rooms they're big parts of our family yearbooks they're just such beautiful pictures because I forced myself to look at the day differently and to use my nice camera, which iPhones are pretty great, definitely good enough, but there is a difference when you pull out the fancy camera and when you're a photographer and you, you know how to use it. it. It was kind of a waste for me to just never take pictures of my kids with that camera. Honestly, one of my favorite ones from the whole, all the years I did it is my daughter in the baby carrier, like car seat sitting next to the bags at Trader Joe's at my car. Like I set her down while I was loading my groceries into the car. And I just was like, it was a sunny day, took this picture and I love it. It's on the wall <laughs> in her bedroom because I don't have that baby carrier anymore. And I never would have thought to take a picture of that with my cell phone, but because I had intentionally set aside that day to document every little moment, I, I took that picture. It's one of my favorites. And I love what Vanessa has to add. But the photos that I love the most are just the randoms taken in our home of like us laying around watching TV or of my mom cooking in the kitchen. Um, just those photos of everyday life, what our, the inside of our van looked like with all the car seats in our 15 passenger van. And so I knew that I wanted to be documenting those everyday moments of our family's life. You know, sometimes I think as mothers and as parents, we're documenting from our point of view. But if you like try to put yourself in their shoes, um, like what's their favorite meal? Like 
you know, what, what does their bedroom look like and their closet look like and their favorite outfit and their friends. Those are the things that they're going to want to remember. I really wish I had a picture of what my room looked like when I was 13. I That's think a I remember, great point. but I, my favorite color was purple and my mom let me decorate it all purple. I had purple carpet, purple duvet, purple curtains, purple paint, purple, everything. And it didn't take long for me to hate the color purple <laughs> I've on it. And I've told that story to my girls so many times that I wish I had a picture of what that actually looked like. The everyday pictures we take don't always have to be pretty. Here's my sister, Cassie again. So I tried to, to be really careful not to just take any formal pictures of, of my kids, like at their very best, but to always make sure I'm taking pictures of, well, mostly I try to find humor in them, but I also want to take things that are real. Like I've taken pictures of, oh, I, pregnancy loss. Like that's something that I think is important to not only remember as our family, but to share with others and kind of normalize that. But I'll, you know, share something that has to do with that. Uh, and I'll share when my kids have made like huge messes and it's funny or say funny things. I, a lot of the pictures I take, I take when my kids have said something funny, I just hurry and snap a picture of that moment so that I can write that on my, the caption. So the caption will go onto the, the photo on the chat book so that I can remember whatever the funny thing was that, that the kid said. Another decision to make is who in the family is in charge of taking photos. It can be more than one person, but it's a good thing to figure it out. In my family, my husband kind of became the official photographer because he always had the newest phone with the best camera. He's also much more artistic than I am and so takes much more beautiful pictures than I do. The problem is that he's not in many of our pictures, although he's good at remembering to take a selfie once in a while. He also works long hours, so he's not around for a lot of the daily moments. So I clearly need to step it up a little, but overall, it's good to have a specialist. If you don't have such an arrangement, it might be good to communicate before vacations or events to decide who's going to be taking pictures, or you might not end up with any. Of course, the photographer doesn't even have to be part of your family. Lots of families outsource annual family photos, and Miss Freddie had a client who hired a photographer to follow them around for a day and, and document their real life. The next challenge we're going to talk about is how to narrow down your photos so you don't have so many, a new problem for our digital age. Libna starts the process by being selective about the photos she takes in the first place. So I've become more mindful of what I take right now rather than just uh, clicking randomly. I feel like, what if I never see this again? Or... What if I come to a point or a stage in my life where I will not be able to remember this? Then this is my like uh, preservation of this moment. And then I can look at it and it will make some sort of a connection. Because if I see something uh, that has moved me enough to pick up my camera and take a shot, that means it's worth preserving for me, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's not like I'm just walking around <laughs> constantly with a phone camera on. Right. But it's something that you... It touched you deeply enough that you want to preserve it. Miss Freddie narrows down her photos with a nightly habit. What I do daily is review my camera roll from today, delete the stuff I don't need, or make decisions. If it was a big day, like someone's birthday, and I took a whole bunch of pictures, I make the decisions then that night about, well, that one's the best in that series. I'm just going to keep that one. And when you're doing that, I call it a daily delete. When you're doing that daily, it doesn't feel like so much work because it's only one day that you're looking at and some days there's not very much. And some days there's a lot of screenshots and you can delete them all, but at least you're making those decisions daily so that the, the junk doesn't accumulate as much. If that seems like too often for you, here's what Vanessa does. For me, what has been the game changer is creating a regular weekly habit to go back through the photos that I've taken and get rid of the stuff that I don't want. I don't think there's anything wrong with taking 10 snaps of the one photo that you hope to get because they're children and they're going to be moving around. And it just, sometimes it takes 10 to get the one good one that you actually want to keep. But what happens if we don't go back and clean out the garbage, then when we need that photo for either our chat books or for some project or whatever, we're just drowning in a million 
things that we don't really need. So I have something that I call the Sunday select Sundays are, you know, a chance, a time of reflection for me. And part of my um, looking back on the week and then preparing for the week ahead is I go through and I just delete all of the junk. And um, sometimes it's 50 photos. Sometimes it's literally like 300 photos that I get rid of. I always like to go back and check to see how much it makes me feel really good. How many I was able to get rid of. Um, and then at the same time, I favorite the ones that I know I want to maybe include in a Christmas card collage or in my chat books, or I've got a big photo gallery wall, the best of the best get favorited. And then, um, at the end of the month, I pick the 30 that represent that past month. And they go in my chat books, uh, in my month book. Um, I also have folders for each of the kids. And so I will also grab the ones that they're in and put them in their folder because at the end of the year, I make them a yearbook and I, it's really easy to just grab all of those photos that way. So it takes a little bit of doing, but I found that it's like this beautiful gratitude practice, honestly, to be able to look back. I mean, sometimes on Sundays I can feel like, ugh, I did not get everything done that I wanted to. And, and I feel this like sense of I'm going to do better next week. And I, I have this like it's like the turning new leaf syndrome, you know, I'm going to do better next week, but let me look back on last week and see what was actually good. Cami also goes through her photos almost daily, like Miss Freddie, but has a bit of a different system using her private blog. Whenever I take pictures now, I just have the Blogspot app on my phone. Anyway, so when I have time or when I'm like in a carpool line or just at home at night when I'm just feel lazy and don't want to do anything. I'll just look through my phone and look at all the pictures that I have on there, like Amazon photos. And then I'll just paste all the photos on there. Like the photos I like, I'll pretty much paste all the ones that I like. And then I'll write like a title at the top. And then I'll go back later and write about it. So I've been doing that for a, pretty much since Daniel was born. I haven't always done it on my phone. I've done it on the computer, but still the same blog. I really just blog about everything, like even a cute picture of one of my kids or like any, any activity, um, I'll just post all of it. This is just the tip of the iceberg of how Cami records her family story, but we'll save the rest for the next episode. With five kids 11 and under, Cassie doesn't take the time to clean up her camera roll, but she has figured out a habit that works for her. So I have a giant camera roll. <laughs> like it is all, like all the stuff that I've saved like as far as storage goes it's it's ridiculous like it's a jumbled mess but I do take my favorite pictures and make an Instagram post immediately because I know I'll forget if I don't so I make an Instagram post and then it goes to my chat book and I don't have to think about it again before I started researching for this episode it hadn't even occurred to me that I could outsource organizing my photos Miss Freddie and her team can actually access your computer, sort through and organize your photos, help you back them up, and even create photo books for you. Older kids are a great resource for this too. It can be a fun process for them to go through the pictures. Once when my two oldest boys were fighting, I started them on a project to make a photo book together of all the good times they've had together. That served many purposes. So after you've organized your camera roll, it's time to figure out everything else. Or as Miss Freddie says, you'll pick where you want your photo life to be. And if Apple Photos is that for you, then my advice is bring everything there. And that usually is the missing link is people have just what they've taken with their phone in Apple Photos. But having all your pictures in one place, whether that's Apple or Google or Amazon, is the, the key. Because then when you use facial recognition to see pictures of your kid's life, it's not just since this you got this phone. It's since the kid was born or it's your whole life, all the way back to your childhood if you've scanned your photos. So I think the key is you gotta go all in, get your whole life, all your digital items into one system. And you can pick the one that works for you. If you're not a Mac user, then I don't think Apple Photos is worth it. If you're an Android user, you're kind of forced into Google Photos sometimes. So that might be an okay solution. But even as I'm saying, you put everything into one basket. I also want to make sure that you have backups then. So let's say you get everything organized all in Apple Photos. You also want to have that saved to a hard drive and then you want to have it backed up to some non-Apple cloud so that 
should something happen to iCloud, I've seen lots of examples where people lose things out of iCloud, not really in their control, like uh, a kid wipes their phone or a kid locks them out of their phone or something happens to iCloud. I just don't want everyone's eggs to be in one basket and yeah. not have backups in place. So go all in on one system so that you can fully utilize all of the benefits of the technology there, but then make sure you have backups of that that are yeah. outside of that system in case something goes wrong. So, so how frequent is that? Like how frequently should you back everything up to your hard drive? I tell people once a year okay. um, because you can have two cloud systems on your phone at once. Like let's say you're all in on Apple Photos and iCloud. You could also have Amazon Photos installed on your phone and backing it up. And so you have those two in play. And then maybe once a year you update your hard drive just so it doesn't get too far out of date. But I don't want it to be something you're worried about every day or every month because that feels too overwhelming. I think once a year is, is plenty for the hard drive. This is the final and most important thing we're going to talk about, backing up our photos. We all have stories of the photos we've lost. Mine happens to be my wedding photos. You see, back in the olden days, pictures were recorded on these little rolls of film. To the best of our knowledge, our photographer reloaded his camera on the lawn of the temple where we got married and must have left the two or probably more rolls of film he'd already finished there on the lawn. He snapped a few more awkward shots with that new roll, one of us just sitting on the lawn and that weird shot of our hands that everybody has, before taking some pictures at a reception we kind of threw together in a church gym. We didn't even hire a photographer for the nice outdoor receptions in each of our hometowns because, well, we thought we'd already have so many photos. I can laugh about it now, but it took me a while to stop getting teary-eyed when we looked at our friend's gorgeous wedding photos. The moral of this story is, back up those photos. We don't physically lose film these days, but people lose digital photos all the time. Case in point, I recently went to look for newborn pictures of my daughter, and they were nowhere to be found. Luckily, my dad is the one who took them, and his photos are so organized that he was able to send them right away. Vanessa took a class from Miss Freddie to figure out her own photo organizing system. Here's what she came up with. We back everything up to the cloud through iCloud. Google Photos, I love Google Photos because their AI is unparalleled. It is huh. so easy to find a photo. For example, I wanted to make a book uh, for my daughter of all pictures of our cat. And you just type in cat and every photo you've ever put in Google Photos that has a cat in it, even a video, if you have a video with one second of a cat walking through it, they will tag it. And so it's so easy to make books based on um, you know, specific people, or oh, I wanted to do a book of different skiing pictures and you just type in snow skiing and it pulls up all the snow skiing pictures. Anyway, I love Google photos for that. And then Dropbox is kind of the long-term storage at the end of every year. I will, um, when everything's been curated, I will put all the ones that I want to keep forever and ever in Dropbox. So if organizing and backing up your photos seems like a giant undertaking, especially if you also have a box or two of hard copy photos and videotapes hanging around, Miss Freddie, of course, has great advice. Yeah. I always instruct people to start with digital okay. because digital is really what's contributing to your overwhelm. It's not the box in the basement of photos that's like making you feel overwhelmed. It's your phone and the old computers and the hard drives. It's the digital world that's making you feel overwhelmed. And so we start there and get everything into one place. No more being scattered across multiple computers, multiple drives, multiple phones. Everything is in one place. And then I usually recommend organizing it in folders by year and month just to give it some simple structure. And then I set up a backup system so that it all is being saved, duplicated somewhere else in the cloud so that if anything happens to that drive or that computer, you don't have to panic. Um, and once there's a digital house in order like that, like here's my folders by year and month, it becomes much easier to tackle the scanning and the digitization process because you don't want to scan a thousand photos and then have more digital files that you don't know where to put or how to back up. So once you get your digital system in order, it's so much easier to then tackle a scanning project and layer those digital files into your existing library. So that's, uh, yeah, usually I instruct people start with digital and then you can move on to scanning those boxes that are in your basement. I'm hoping that this episode makes you less overwhelmed by helping you identify the next baby step that will help you get your photo life in order. 
Don't let it overwhelm you. Take a course from Miss Freddie if you need a boost, or even hire her to organize them for you. If nothing else, keep taking those photos and backing them up, of course. And stay tuned for next week when we'll talk about how these moms and a few others use their photos, plus things they've written, to tell their family's story. Thank you so much for listening to the How She Moms podcast and for being part of this community. There are so many other ways for you to connect and hopefully also contribute. I share tips and ideas regularly on Instagram and Facebook at How She Moms, and we also have a Facebook group that you can join, which is the main place for more philosophical discussions about the ideas I'll be discussing on future episodes of the podcast. It's also one of the best ways for you to contribute to future episodes. You can find past episodes and other resources at HowSheMoms.com. I have big plans for revamping my site this fall, so stay tuned for that. And you can always just email me directly at Whitney at HowSheMoms.com. Special thanks to my own wonderful mom, Susan Singley, for recording my theme music. She played this song all the time when I was growing up, and to me, it's the soundtrack of motherhood. <laughs>